I wasn't a particularly gifted student. I wasn't a, a prefect or a house captain or anything like that. In fact, you know, one of the biggest drivers for me was some of the teachers and the high school principal at the time actually said to me, Jay, we can't make you a prefect because Asians don't have leadership skills. But that, that stuck with me for a very long time because interestingly, you know, um, there was a bit of vindication at the end as well, because when I was elected onto the city of Monash, which was an area where my school uh, was also located, um, I, gave the, I gave a commencement address at the school when I was deputy mayor and the same principal was still there. So, uh, you know, and, and, you know, when he sort of, he was so surprised to see me, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if he remembered what he said to me casually. I don't expect him to remember that, but that sort of you know, made me think about who I am and what I wanted to pursue, that I had a point to prove. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Professional Development Forum or PDF for short. My name is Jeffrey Wang. I'm the founder and your host for this evening. Um, for those of you who's new to PDF, uh, PDF was re established to help diverse young professionals find fulfillment in the modern workplace. We believe that everyone should have access to a knowledge mindset and network to become the best version of themselves. Now, who, which of you is new here tonight? Is there any newcomers tonight? Anyone here for the first time? Hi, Jeff. I'm new to here. Ah, oh, welcome, Sandy. Sandy. Welcome, Sandy. All yeah, right. that's me okay. too. Awesome, awesome. Well, um, so in the chat box, um, any, you know, tell, tell us where you're from. If you're, you know, whether you're from Sydney, Melbourne, uh, Andy, Andy's got their hand up. Oh, Andy's new. Oh, of course, Andy's new here today. Um, yeah, please tell us where you're from because I think it's going to be really interesting. Oh, Newcastle. Oh, of course, Newcastle. <laughs> the mothership. Sydney. Uh, okay. That's an inside joke, by the way. I, I work with Will and the head office in Newcastle. Oh, New Caledonia. Look at that. New Caledonia, Melbourne. Okay. Oh, Japan. Of course. Hello, <laughs> Greg. Western Sydney. And that's like a different place to Sydney, of course. Um, <laughs> Greenacre, Sydney, cousin suburb to Basim's Baxter. Oh, I love it. I love this today. Taipei City. Okay. And uh, yeah, say hi to Andrew, who has just gotten out of quarantine in Taipei City. Uh, Southwest, Tony, yep, yeah, represent Melbourne. Awesome. Direct land in Southwest Sydney. All right. Two. And so, oh, Susanna's joining from Dark, oh, Dark and Jong land in Sydney's Central Coast. Awesome. Melbourne, there you go. Well done. So I can't wait for us to um, bring these sessions back into, you know, real life sessions. <laughs> so hopefully we'll, we'll see that in our lifetime um, when, you know, lockdown finally ends in Melbourne. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess the, the, sometimes you got to look at the, the positive, you know, the, the good things, you know, the best thing about the pandemic for me is the opportunity to actually network globally, you know, to have these people join and from all around the globe, you know, whether you're from Singapore, Shanghai, Silicon Valley, all the likes. Um, we'd like you to turn on the camera and, and update your names if you can. Um, I know some of you are probably eating dinner, but you know, um, we welcome you to try and, you know, connect with us. Um, now I think one of the team will be posting a link to our online community. Please feel free to join us. Um, and, uh, just before we start, I just want to, uh, tell everyone that, uh, please note that this session will be recorded and it's being broadcasted live to LinkedIn. Uh, and the recording will be subsequently distributed via social media. So tonight's session, what we'll do is we'll start with a fireside chat and followed by Q and A. Uh, please feel free to ask your questions anytime, anytime in the chat box. And then, um, you know, we, we will invite you to ask your questions. So tonight I'm actually particularly excited because I'm being joined by a very dear friend of mine. So Ji Yong is the founding director of the Center for Asian Australian Leadership at the, uh, at the Australian National University. This was established in January, 2020. Um, so the Center for Asian Australian Leadership aims to address the significant underrepresentation of Asian Australians in leadership, uh, positions in enterprise and government, right? So while Ji Yong is no stranger to leadership, um, actually Jay on there's no stranger to leadership because he was the executive officer for, um, the honorable Gareth Evans, um, it was the chancellor of the Australian, uh, Australian, Australian national university. Uh, and, uh, what you probably already know about Jay Yong is that he was the deputy mayor of Monash city 
And many of you probably already heard of Joe Yong because of his extensive writing and public speaking in the media on topics such as diversity and the Asian century and the likes. But as impressive as his, as impressive as his resume is, um, the thing I love about Joe Yong is he's one of those high character guys that I can disagree with on almost everything <laughs> and we'll still be best mates. And the, and the thing I find about Jay Yong is we'll never, ever have enough time on the call. Whenever we catch up, <laughs> it always goes about half an hour over and then we still have stuff to talk about. So can we all please put our hands together for Jay Yong? Oh, Jeffrey, too kind, too kind. And, uh, right back at you, mate, because this conversation has been a couple of years in the making and. It's a real honor and a, and a privilege to join the PDF forum. Uh, I think we talked about this a few years ago in, in terms of coming up to Sydney and doing it in person. But as you said, the pandemic, whilst it's been a real, uh, bummer and a negative experience for so many people, it has enabled PDF to, to grow nationally and internationally as well to reach, um, new audiences from across the country and the globe. So, but also more importantly, it's a real honor to be a part of so many, you know, a list of preeminent speakers, you know, who have been before me on the PDO platform. And I want to thank you for, uh, for coming out of retirement <laughs> in, in, in moderating this conversation, in having this fire chat, fireside chat without the fire, uh, here, um, through the zoom platform, on, um, about this very important topic and, and also, uh, you know, the opportunity just to connect with so many people, um, on the call and I see, um, my good friend, Karen Loon coming in from Singapore. Um, thank you, Karen. Uh, Lee, Dr. Lee Martin, you know, one of our 40 under 40 most influential Asian Australian awardees this year in the education category. Good to see you, um, Lee. And, um, and also, uh, my, my good friend, uh, my dear friend, uh, to Lee, which, uh, which I've seen tune in as well. So, you know, two was, uh, uh, we've become really good friends in the last couple of weeks, you know, just, just talking about the, the role and, um, the representation of Asian Australians in Australian politics and, uh, two has really become the, um, you know, the mover and shaker and the face of wanting to push for greater cultural diversity, um, in Australian politics. So great to see you too. And hopefully so many other friends and we could connect with, um, over the next little while. But before I begin, Jeffrey, I wanted to also acknowledge, um, our traditional owners, um, for me in Melbourne, it's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Uh, and I wish to pay my respects to elders, both past, present and future. And what a sincere hope for me is to obviously see reconciliation in our lifetime here in Australia and the closer, um, engagement between Asian Australians and our first nations people. So, uh, I pay, I pay my respects to you to, to them. So, but let's get into this conversation, mate. I really look forward to it. And I look forward to everybody's questions and insights during the conversation as well. Um, feel free to sort of pop them into the chat. Feel free to put your hand up, throw them in there. And if I miss hit something, or if you want me to expand on a particular point, let's, let's get into it, Jeffrey. Awesome. Awesome. So, well, well, let's get into it now as, as much as we love to talk about our favorite topics. Okay. Um, I, I think, uh, everyone here tonight is here because they're interested in, um, I, I, I suppose finding, you know, finding your, the secrets of your success. So. I want to just dig into, you know, straight to the point basically. So I want to ask you, what was the turning point that made you to go from a shy kid to someone who was confident of speaking up and getting noticed? Oh, what a way to kick off. Like I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't particularly see myself as a shy kid. I think, uh, growing up, uh, I was more of a, a mediocre kid. So, um, I like to compare myself for those Harry Potter fans out there. To Ronald Weasley, you know, somebody who's not very good at anything in particular, not, uh, particularly shines in a, in, in, in an area of expertise. Like when I was growing up, I wasn't very good at, I was okay, but I wasn't super good at academia, you know, sport, music, drama. So I think I, I did a whole bunch of things, but I wasn't particularly good at one particular one, one specific thing. So. I didn't see myself as an Asian. I saw myself as a Bijan or a C. I was a bit of a C, a B, C, D type of student. So I wasn't particularly impressive on the academic front, but I think the real changing point for me, Jeffrey was a uh, high school debating. So I remember representing my school, um, which was a, pri a private independent school 
in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, um, you know, representing them uh, in debating contests, you know, in, in creating competitions, inter-school debating competitions. And uh, again, not super impressive in debating. I was the second speaker, not the first or the third. The first speaker is the one that sets it all up, sets all the arguments. The second speaker steers the ship a little bit and the third speaker knocks it down the park. So again, mediocre, not particularly, um, you know, good at, at, at anything in sort of that structuring that sort of debate or that argument. But it was really high school debating that really gave me the confidence to speak up. It really gave me the confidence to transcend the written word into the speaking word. So I think, you know, that gave me a lot of confidence, uh, to pursue future aspirations, uh, in university, as well as early parts of my career. And I really owe that to uh, my debating coach at school. Um, and what it really amazed me though, because when I was doing a lot of these inter-school debating competitions back then in the early two thousands was there were not many Asian kids and they were also doing debating. So again, you know, I would share the stage with predominantly white and Anglo. Aussies, um, I found myself, you know, again, the minority, uh, but what surprised me most was during the highest was during year 12 graduation was I was awarded the debating award, which was quite surprising because again, second speaker, nothing too impressive. Um, but I think it was my consistency and my determination and my passion to wanting to improve, um, that sort of made me stand out as compared to my other debating classmates. So really high school debating was a changing, was a, was a turning point for me. Okay. So, so, I mean, did this, this obviously invites a question. Is that, is that just your typical Asian humility speaking? Or, I mean, if you, if you won the debating award, surely, you know, at some point you realize you could go toe to toe with these people, you know, potentially through these interactions, through these experiences that you have, you know, at, at what point do you realize that you're as good as anybody else? So I guess that that's probably the, another way of asking that question. Oh, no, that's a very, I mean, that's a very important point because as the second speaker, you're not particularly like your, your job is just to add a few new arguments, but also see the ship. You hand it over to the third speaker who will knock it out of the park with the final, with the final argument. Um, so I was, I was too sure actually, because I actually lost more than I won. So our teams were like getting humbled by other teams. So I wasn't, I wasn't exactly sure like why they actually gave me the award. So I had a bit of like, um, you know, uh, self imposter syndrome where I was like, how did I actually get this? Um, I still have that award. Um, you know, I still put that proudly in my shelf because it was the first award I, I, I won. Um, at the end, I wasn't a particularly gifted student. I wasn't a a prefect or a house captain or anything like that. In fact, you know, one of the biggest drivers for me was some of the teachers and the high school principal at the time actually said to me, Jay, you we can't make you a prefect because Asians don't have leadership skills. Well, that, that stuck with me for a very long time because interestingly, you know, um, there was a bit of vindication at the end as well, because when I was elected onto the city of Monash, which was an area where my school uh, was also located, um, I gave the, I gave a commencement address at the school when I was deputy mayor. And the same principal was still there. So, uh, you know, and, and, you know, when he sort of, he was, he was so surprised to see me, you know, not, I'm not sure he remembered what he said to me casually. I don't expect him to remember that, but that sort of you know, made me think about who I am and what I wanted to pursue that I had a point to prove. Um, and, and when he sort of invited me back to his office, uh, you know, for, for, uh, for, for scones and coffee right after the, uh, the, the commencement address. It was, it was vindication for me that, okay, I've made it, you know, like I've proven him wrong, you know, and, uh, and I think you know, it was a great way of sort of sending a message to the kids in the audience, because when I started that school, there was only like a handful of Asian kids. There's probably like three or four of us. Uh, but, uh, by the time I was looking up from the podium, speaking at the commencement address and <laughs> when I was deputy mayor, I reckon about 80% of the school was of Asian descent. And so it really, it was just that this just change that embraced the school that reflected our society really. So hopefully those kids, uh, could go back and go away and do amazing things themselves. And hopefully they can have the opportunities that I didn't have or the barriers that I didn't face that I faced that they wouldn't face. So it, it was a really sort of like planning moment for me to, to get to, to be able to do that. Okay. So from, from I'm hearing though, there must be a bit of a turning point because, you know, for whatever reason, the, this principal thought that you weren't ready to be uh, a prefect because, you know, he didn't have, he didn't sort of demonstrate the leadership qualities. 
but, but at the same time, you're already out there debating, you're already on stage, you won the debating award. So what, what exactly are these leadership qualities that he was looking for? Is it a case of speaking up? Is it a case of, you know, uh, I, I don't even know really what, what is it, the qualities that you think he was looking for that you were missing at the time that you didn't have that you later picked up along, along the way? Yeah, I thought that's a good question because I think, you know, the becoming a prefect has a multi, has a couple of things, you know, obviously you have got to have good marks and I didn't have that. Uh, you, you, I guess, you know, demonstrate, you know, uh, willingness to be assertive. And I think I didn't really have that at the time as well. Um, I think my changing point during my schooling years was really between year 11 and year 12, because year 11, I was under the pressure of actually doing a lot of the subjects that my Asian friends outside of school were doing. So I call it the Asian five, and that is, you know, advanced maths, maths, accounting, physics, chemistry, and like, I totally suck at numbers. Um, and so I didn't really do that well in year 11. And it was actually my careers teacher at the time who said to me, mate, you just got to pivot. You just got to be able to do things that you want. Don't be pressured by your friends or your classmates or people, you know, outside of school to, uh, to be actually doing what they're doing. So I switched to humanities. So I picked up international relations. I picked up history. I picked up English, you know, and, and, um, and I think, yeah, that's where I really shined. Um, so I, I went a lot to that careers teacher and, you know, to be fair, it wasn't just the principal who thought I didn't have leadership abilities. I think most of the school staffing community thought I didn't have those abilities and to be able to see them again, when I arrived back as deputy mayor was really, you know, and, and you know, good for them for actually, some of them actually said to me, you know, we, we were very surprised to see you evolve like this and actually become the person who you are today. So I give credit to those teachers. Uh, for admitting that they were wrong and then, and, and actually hopefully it was a learning period for them that you can't judge a book by its cover. And that is you can't deem whether somebody has leadership qualities at that such a young age, because you can learn these things, you can evolve, you can adapt, and you can sort of take these things with you as you, you know, uh, prosper in your career. So, uh, I, I think, you know, it was, it, it's been a real sort of surreal journey for me because I didn't actually take that sort of conventional path throughout my career. And we can talk a bit about that as well. Um, but, uh, I'll be very, I've had very supportive parents, you know, I didn't have those typical Asian parents that sort of told me to do law or be a doctor or anything like that. So they were super supportive in what I wanted to do. And I think that helped as well to ease some of the pressure. In fact, a lot of the pressure came from my Asian friends who were, who were doing amazingly academically, you know, and, um, and here, and, and again, back at university, you know, all my Asian friends who were studying like commerce and engineering and science. And then, you know, and then I did arts and I'll go to my lectures and I'll be the only Asian in the lecture room and then go to my shoots. I'll be the only Asian there. Um, so it's, it's sort of, I always felt that I wasn't Aussie enough to be Aussie and not Asian enough to be Asian. So, and I think, you know, the ability to understand that and also the ability to walk between those two walls has been quite beneficial throughout my career. So I, I've been, um, able to embrace what I, what I've enjoyed and my passion. And I think that's the message I want to give to everybody today is, you know, um, if you, you know, the, the decision to, to learn to speak up and to stand out is if you remain consistent and authentic and who you are. So we can get, we can get a bit more into that through the conversation. Yep. Now I can already see a couple of really cool, uh, storylines developing, but yeah. And, and I just want to reemphasize what you said there. Um, so the, 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 if you, if you take away one thing with you today. Um, it is the fact that, you know, where you start is not where you're going to end up. You know, the fact that, you know, you could, uh, just because you didn't demonstrate these leadership skills at, at a young age, doesn't mean that you can't, you can't grow into a leader. And I think, you know, G on your, your living example of that. And certainly I think a lot of people become a leader, uh, sometimes not, not because you're born with it. You know, a lot of leaders are, are made because of the situation, because of the need, because of the, the purpose that you carry. Um, and we'll, we'll dig into that a bit longer, uh, a bit, a bit later, but you mentioned the word pivot and I really like that because your, your entire career has been a massive pivot as well. Right. So, so this, can you tell us a bit more about the journey, how you went from, um, essentially a, a policy wonk to a, uh, to an, uh, an Asian Australian advocate, you know, pretty much the Asian Australian advocate. So, so, um, you know, that was a massive pivot right there as well. Right. So can you tell us a bit about that, that journey? No, no, uh, absolutely, Jeff. And, um, I'm not sure whether I shared this with you before, but, um, and some people on the call may know this, but I actually had aspirations to be a diplomat. So that was my aspiration. Um, and the reason for that is, um, I wanted to pursue that career because of wanting to be accepted by Australia. And the best way of being accepted is if you represent your country's interests abroad. 
And I saw it only two ways of doing that. You can only represent your country really in two ways. One is as an Olympian on the Olympic stage, which I never had the skills for or the talent for. So that, that aspiration was never going to eventuate. And the second one was, um, was representing country's interests abroad through the diplomacy field. And so being a diplomat was my lifelong ambition. And I remember, uh, my graduation photos, um, I, I had a huge smile on my face because that was the day that I received a call by the department of foreign affairs and trade that I made it into the second interview stage, um, of being of the, um, of, of the DFAT grad program. Unfortunately, I didn't make it, uh, you know, uh, there were many other people that had uh, better qualifications and experiences and probably a better language ability or better like outlook on the world compared to me. Um, I was very disheartened because that's what I wanted to set my mind towards. Um, ever since I started, uh, picking up my international relations subjects in year 12 and history subjects in year 12, and then eventually doing international relations and politics and Asian studies at university. And so when I you know, received that. I didn't get that sort of uh, entry point into DFAT. I was particularly disappointed. Um, so I said to myself, you know what, I, I could potentially find my way back there again. Um, but I needed a job and started fresh out of university. I need to get my career going. I didn't want to, uh, give myself a break or I didn't want to, you know, lose that momentum. So I ended up uh, taking on a job with the Ethnic Communities Council of Australia, oh, Ethnic Communities Council of Victoria, the ECCV. Now the ECCV is a statewide peak body, uh, that advocates for multiculturalism in Victoria. Um, I started there as a policy officer and a project officer, and that experience kickstarted a lifelong passion for cultural diversity and multiculturalism, a lifelong commitment to, uh, making sure that Australia lives up to its values of multiculturalism, but at the same time, supporting people from different backgrounds in order to build the prosperity of this country in order to find their sense of belonging, helping new migrants, helping new refugees. Um, just like how my parents received that help when they arrived here in the seventies. So giving back by supporting, you know, new migrants, new refugees to, and give them the opportunities that I got that they strived to achieve. And that's why in, in terms of like why they've decided to make that journey to Australia. So that experience enabled me to not only pivot. But it kickstarted a lifelong journey. So, um, I've worked in this, in a number of different, um, uh, areas. Uh, I had a stint in the Essendon football club. I, uh, I worked in disability policy, um, as a policy officer in the, uh, national disability services. I worked at a think tank, CEDA committee for economic development of Australia as a conference producer, events person. I've worked in the Victorian local government association, lobbying for local government reform. But I think the real key highlight for me, um, early parts of my career was being elected as a counselor at the city of Monash at the age of 23. So I was very young. I was very inexperienced. Wow. Uh, I was, um, it was a real honor really. And again, you know, entering politics and getting that reassurance from your local community is very similar to being a diplomat in that sort of seeking acceptance. That was a real motivator for me to enter politics at a such a young age because Having the confidence from your fellow citizens who would vote for you to try and make a difference at that local level politically was a huge draw card for me. Um, it was a huge sense of fulfillment. I, I sort of understood the responsibilities that I had, but at the same time, I was really excited about the, the opportunities to make a difference. And so that sort of like suppressed my urge of applying for, um, being a diplomat with DFAT. So that kept me busy for eight years. I served two terms, eventually rising to the position of deputy mayor. Um, sometimes I look back at that experience. Uh, and if you want to ask what the returning point was, I think that was the turning point for me from my career, 23 years old, managing, working with 10 other counselors who have decades of experience over me, working with senior council officers who have decades of experience over me. Um, and being a 23 year old managing, helping to manage and provide strategic direction to a $160 million budget with a budget, a city council budget that is even larger than the city of Hobart. Like that was pretty daunting, you know, for a 23 year old. And I had to mature very quickly. I had to grow very quickly. I had to get my confidence up very quickly. I had to find my place amongst a group of gray suited, you know, gray suited men with gray hair who 
probably didn't think that I'd belong there and had to find my feet and, you know, earn their respect. And I spent a lot of years doing that. And I think when I left council, uh, after eight years, I think I left a better person, a more experienced person. And, um, you know, sometimes when, you know, you can't really measure success in, in politics sometimes because you, it's, it's really difficult, but I can, I can still see some of the, the playgrounds that we funded, some of the initiatives that we did, um, you know, Monash City Council was one of the very first councils in Victoria to have a sustainability climate change roadmap. This was in 20, 2009. Uh, you know, these are some of the changes that we made that I, that I had the privilege of leading and driving, you know, um, we tried to reduce from gambling. We, we elevated affordable housing. We, I think, you know, those were the, the pivotal moments and I look back now that said, you know what, it really gave me the confidence to advocate, to champion and just off. Um, and it's really equipped me well, um, and given me the skills and the confidence to do my current job at, at the center for Asian Australian leadership. So a pretty, uh, you know, roller coaster career. Um, I'm not sure whether I want to uh, go back into diplomacy, to be honest. <laughs> um, but certainly that was, uh, you know, again, the key the message is, you know, we, we need to have aspirations. We need to have dreams, but if you can't achieve that earlier on, you can sort of find a different path. Um, and you know, coming back to full circle. I did have a chance to dabble in a little bit of diplomacy when I worked as a consultant and an advisor to help the city of Hobart set up a sister city relationship with the city of Xi'an in China. That was my little foray into diplomacy. Um, and I got my sense of fulfillment. I had, I had an opportunity to represent Australia. I was able to sign and establish a very important relationship for our two countries. Um, and it gave me a lot of fulfillment. So. Um, I'm glad I was able to do that throughout my career and, um, and, and give them that opportunity. So, but new challenges lie ahead for me at the moment. Absolutely. I love the way, I love the, the word that you use there, fulfillment. Um, and, and it seems to be the key here, like the key driver that you, you must have discovered this passion, um, uh, within you that basically gave you the courage, gave you the, uh, the drive to step outside of your comfort zone and, you know, step up, stand, you know, stand up for what you believe in, run for council, advocate for communities and. You know, and, and essentially when you spoke about, uh, your little stint in setting up that city, uh, sister city relationship, clearly that, 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 um, that is all driven by passion, you know, it's, it's probably a labor of love. So I want the labor of love, Jeff, and you was, uh, it was a love job, you know, like I, um, as a consultant, I didn't charge the city of Hobart, I, I spent, they paid for my travel and what is it and my accommodation, um, because I could have charged, um, most people would say that I should have charged, but for me, it was a love job because it was. Um, something that was yearning within me to try and build closer relationships between my, my homeland, my native land, you know, um, and, and I think there was that sort of connection that I wanted to forge and I was able to do that through this relationship and, um, it gave me a lot of fun and, um, and I guess I'm back now at, at the, the state of play with the current bilateral relationship, it does very, and that does very much sadden me because I, I see what it could do potentially, you know, when the things are on the rise. So. But it did give me a lot of fulfillment. Um, and it's, um, I think again, you know, it goes back to the passion and authenticity and having a real understanding of what you want to do and what you stand for. And I think that's always been the message that I want to give. And that is don't deviate from that, you know, don't deviate from your values, don't deviate from your principles, draw that line somewhere, um, be, be adventurous, be, you know, be, be innovative, but at the same time, draw that line around what you, what you stand for. And. When you're authentic about what you stand for, it, it shines shine out and people can see that. Yep. And, and, and that's, that's, well, I guess that's a great segue because how do you find out, well, how do you know what you stand for? How, how do you know which are, which are the things that, that ultimately give you fulfillment? You, you know, it sounds like you found it at a very young age at 23. Um, how does the rest of us find what gives us that sense of fulfillment so that we can, we know what we're about? And does that, oh. and, and, and here's the other part, does it change because you talk about consistency, right? So has your, you know, has your, has what you've been about changed over the years, you know, as you have, you know, matured and grown, have you changed your mind on, on what, you know, what, what your ultimate purpose is? Oh, I've always, um, the ultimate purpose for me, Jeffrey is to, is to give back. And I think this is where, um, I, I try to hold that in everything I do. And, and politics is a good example because you do run into people mm -hmm. that have different political views. You and I are a good example. Uh, we're completely opposite on the political spectrum, but at the same time, there's a lot of respect there because you acknowledge that, um, you're there for also for the right reason. 
And I think, um, this is where I've seen people stumble, um, throughout my career where I've seen a lot of young people, not just young people, but I've seen people, um, you know, for example, one day they might be writing high in their, in their profile and in their work. Um, and then one day that they're a nobody and they're just crashing down. Um, and people said that to me when I was in politics, you know, everywhere I went, when I was a councillor, deputy mayor, they'd be like, hello, councillor, hello, deputy mayor, the honorable, blah, blah, blah. Um, I've always, I've always like shivered at that because I knew that that won't last. The, fe the, the feather dust will never last. And I think, um, I wasn't, I didn't have a problem in stepping down from that. You know, one day you were a councillor and you're deputy mayor. And then the next day you decide to not do that anymore and you become very low again. And then. Um, I've seen so many politicians and other people, public figures actually not know how to adjust to that post political life, um, because the feather dust has gone off and yesterday there were somebody and the next day there were nobody. Um, but for me, I didn't really struggle with that as much because I, I knew why I was there. Um, I knew that I was there to, um, to, to make a difference. I didn't lose the election. I didn't lose, I didn't get booted out of office. I decided to step away out of an accord because I felt that I've achieved everything I wanted to achieve and I wanted to do something new. So again, you know, I think it's about, if you know why you're there, um, it's easier to accept failure. It's easier to accept setbacks, um, because you always have that bigger picture in mind, but back to your question. Um, I think, you know, when people, uh, find out what they stand for, I think it starts off with their fundamental principles and values. What are they? And everybody has a set of those. Uh, and then you move on to, okay, what am I, what can I do to help me enhance those values and have those values be, become part of that sort of like profile that I have. Um, so I think, you know, most people go to, you know, they do a lot of stuff. I do a lot of self-reflection. I think it's probably my Chinese and Asian upbringing that I reflect a lot. I think a lot, I think about, um, how I'm perceived by other people. Am I making a difference? Am I helping others? Um. And I think, you know, when you reflect that much, you tend to work out what you stand for pretty early. And I think, you know, working out for what you stand for leads to the ability to build that professional brand. And, um, and that's something that we, I wanted to talk about with everybody today is how do we build that professional brand and what, and, um, how, what do we do to, to actually establish a successful brand? And I would urge, uh, people today who called in, if you haven't found what you stand for, um, don't fret. I think th those moments will come. And for those who have found for what you stand for, I think it's, it's about being consistent to that, being, being authentic to that. Um, and always wear that on your sleeve. I'm somebody who always wear that on my sleeve and always sort of put my heart out there and what I do. And, um, and again, you know, like I didn't expect myself to be an Asian Australian advocate or a cultural diversity champion. Um, that's something that sort of, I adopted uh, throughout my career. And, um, and I think everywhere I rent after my first job at the ethnic communities council of Victoria, I've always had a cultural diversity element to every job that I've taken on. Um, and the ANU is a good example of that, you know, um, and how it's led to the establishment of the center for Asian Australian leadership, um, was a good example of being so passionate about cultural diversity that the people that I was working for and the, my mentors and my, and my sponsors within the ANU some sort of value in that. So, um, and I was being very consistent from the beginning. They know what I stand for. Um, and, um, and they respect that even though they might disagree. <laughs> yeah, no, I can, yeah. And, and it's pretty clear you, you've got this incredibly consistent public brand. Everyone knows exactly what you stand for. Everyone knows what you're about. Um, and you know, and, and that, that Never, that's never changed over, over the years, but, um, I just want to remind everyone, please feel free to ask questions anytime. Um, and, uh, in fact, we'll, we'll probably be proceeding to the, the Q and A stage now. So please type your questions in the chat and we'll invite you to, to ask your question. Um, and so I just want to ask you, uh, well, actually the, the next one I want to, um, uh, ask you is, well, how do you go about what, what, what is the key to successfully establishing a, a good public, you know, so personal and, and professional brand. Uh, I think I, I call it the two C of oh, the three C's, uh, clear, concise and consistency. So I think I've been able to, uh, focus on achieving that, um, over the last couple of years, especially around Asian Australian leadership. So every time you see me talk about, uh, 
an issue publicly, every time you sort of see me post something on LinkedIn or social media, it's always around that sort of umbrella, um, issue around Asian Australian representation and leadership, you know, supporting our emerging Asian Australian leaders, giving them a platform. Um, and sometimes like, you know, you get tempted into venturing into, um, issues like, um, like politics or like current affairs. You know, I, I think I mentioned in a, in a previous post that it's been a while since I comment on politics, um, ever since being out of politics. Um, but when the, uh, the Fowler debacle came about, um, when, when two lead was unfortunately sidelined by the New South Wales Labor Party, I had no, I felt the urge in me to jump out and say something. Um, and I felt that people took that message on because it was something that they knew that I would say it's something that they expected from me. Um, and it's also something that, uh, you know, that a message that I've never deviated from, you know, I'm always about supporting greater cultural diversity, representation, politics, and because I've experienced that myself, I want one of the biggest missions for me was to break down those barriers for Asian Australians entering politics. So, you know, so I remember someone said to me on LinkedIn, oh, it's been a while since you talked about politics. You've been out of politics for like years as you've been, you know, you're no, no longer a member of the political party that you were a member of, you know, and, uh, interesting to see you talk about politics, but then. They read the message carefully and they knew, oh, it's about Asian Australian representation. It's about the lack of representation. So I think when you have that consistency, when you have that, um, conciseness, c concise about, about what you talk about, um, people start to listen. Uh, one, one mentor said to me, you know, don't be a talking head. Don't try and talk about everything and anything, because when you do that, you just become an echo chamber. You just become, um, somebody who, uh, you know, who, who doesn't, he was not seen by others as, you know, an expert or, or a, um, or, or a voice of reason in that particular issue. So think about what you stand, again, work out what you stand for, um, work out what issues are passionate to you and be consistent in, in how you sort of put that message out there. Um, and I think the other, uh, sort of keys to success there, Jeffrey is don't try to take the shortcut. You know, this is a long road ahead. You know, and again, you, know, you can't build consistency without taking the long road. Um, and I can promise you that when you take that long road and that consistent road, you will get results. Um, you know, uh, stick to your guns. I think it's really important. Again, don't, don't, uh, don't sound like your passion for a paycheck. Don't, don't actually deviate from those values. Don't lie. I think it's important, you know, like, <laughs> um, you know, don't, don't, um, you know, I, I've been in a position where back in, in my political career where I had to not support a friend and a colleague in her political aspirations. And rather than doing things behind her back, I told her to her face that I can't support you. I'm not going to support you. And here are other reasons why it's unfortunate because we, we haven't spoken until this day. It's been five, six years and we haven't spoken to this day, but I, I didn't want to do that to that person. I wanted to say it to her in front of her face. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, and also at the same time, you know, it's, it's what would I say? Clear, concise, and consistency and authenticness. You need to be authentic. I think once, cause that, that will shine, um, in, in everything you do. Uh, and again, try to work out what you stand for, um, and, and be consistent in your messaging. Be, be brave as well. Be brave. Be, 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 be fearless in, in what you stand. Absolutely. Now, if you're not connected to Ji Yong, I suggest you, you should, um, especially connect them, connect with them on LinkedIn. Now I have to say the, the writing you, you put up there is a weapons grade, um, persuasion. <laughs> no, that's a new uh, risk. Yeah. You, I think, uh, you, you really have to, to read and like, I read a lot and, and I, you know, and I have to ask you, like, is, is that something that you were professionally trained on or is that something that you can, you developed over the years? You mean about writing Jeffrey? Yeah. Well, well you know, expression, communications, writing, but I mean, clearly you're, you know, when I read your stuff, it's very, very, you know, it's very concise, very clear, very to the point, very, very powerful. Um, and then it's, you know, it's very clear that you wrote with a purpose. Um, not everyone has that level of clarity when it, when it comes to self-expression. So, so, you know, was it, was that something you had to learn? Oh, absolutely. I think with writing, Jeffrey, I remember the first opinion article that I published in 20, in 2007 with a platform called online opinion. Um, that was an atrocious article. Like they, I, I just remember what I looking back at it now and after writing like hundreds of op-ed pieces and essays and then, you know, uh, strategic plans and then policy papers, I look back at that document and I'm like, what was I thinking? 
And I think with writing, you just, you know, there are certain, like, there are sort of programs and classes that you can take and specific training courses that focuses on good writing. But I think for me, um, I just wrote, I just kept on writing, you know, got feedback from people. Um, uh, and also I think for me, I try to write with my heart, you know, and I think again, going back to that authenticity, um, people can see it in my writing. And I think that's where, um, people would then be absorbed in what I'm trying to push for rather than my sentence structure or my grammatical errors. I still make mistakes on prepositions. Prepositions confuse me. Uh, so I think, you know, it's really about if you're able to send through that authenticity again to your writing and to the way you express yourself, um, as well as, uh, speaking as well as other ways of communication. Like I've, I, I've never done any media training. Um, I think the biggest media training I had was going on current affair. And, you know, and then going on Sky News, you know, like those, those were the, the, those were like introductions into like hard hitting media. I've been on like 2GB before, you know, like talking about, um, a racist, um, video game that the Sydney, that the New South Wales government was supporting back in 2013. So I think, you know, I was, um, and being a counselor and being a local politician at the age of 23 sort of gave me that training as well on the go, um, to be able to talk to media and present, um. So I think I owe that a lot to deciding to put myself out there, um, having it a go, having a go, um, and not, 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 not being afraid of making mistakes because you will, you will make mistakes. I've made a couple of gaffes on TV. I've made a <laughs> couple of uh, very strange and questionable comments in media, uh, as well. So, um, but then again, you know, we shouldn't be fearing of failure because you, that's how you learn. That's how you sort of work out again, what you stand for by failing. And, and that's something, um, that I, I, I hold, I hold dear in terms of those experiences. Awesome. Now yeah, I'm glad to see some questions coming in. So Osman, would you like to ask your question? Oh, sure. Thanks Jeff. And hey, Gio, uh, I are you interesting. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, I, I relate to it a lot. I, I'm an immigrant, so I speak English as my second or third language. Uh, so I was kind of, uh, interested in your opinion on how much language is required to become a leader in Australia. The reason is because you mentioned that, uh, in your earlier, uh, early in your career, you kind of miss out on a position because you said, you know, there were people with better language skill. So well, what's your opinion on that? How much, you know, how good your English needs to be to become a leader in Australia? Uh, well, actually, I actually don't think it was my English language skills that didn't get me the job. I think it's because I didn't have a law degree, to be honest, because I think, um, there was a certain, uh, there was a certain type of, uh, personnel and skill set that, you know, the Australian public service was looking for, and I didn't have that. Um, but you know, I, we've always dealt with this question around, do you need perfect English skills to succeed? Um, yes. I don't believe that for a second because I, I look at, you know, I, I look at the, the many successful migrant entrepreneurs that have built, you know, brilliant businesses and enterprises, um, with, you know, a, with very limited English abilities. I mean, my, my parents, for example, when they arrived in the late seventies, they spoke very little English. They were able to set up three businesses, two community organizations one community magazine and they're able to put two of their kids to private school. So I, I don't actually believe that leadership success correlates with English language skills. I think it's, I probably think it's, you know, values and authenticities and what you stand for is more important than, than language ability. So, um, again, I think it's, once you find out what we're really passionate about, I think that breaks down language barriers. You know, people can see that people can feel it, people can sort of relate to it. And, uh, and you're a good example of that, you know, uh, yeah, you, you're working diligently with your coaching business and working with, uh, individuals and how to break through the bamboo ceiling. Um, so I think it's, I wouldn't say that it's a, it's a, it's a key criteria. Um, obviously there is an element of it that helps, but I think it goes back to your determination, your resilience and your ability to, to push forward. And I think a lot of migrants demonstrate that day in, day out. Sure. Very inspiring. Next. That's a, that's a pretty, pretty, um, I think it's a pretty bloody important point. <clears throat> the, the fact is, uh, a lot of us obsess about not having perfect English or speaking with an accent because you're migrant. Um, the truth is it, it, it that, that 
the, the importance that we place on speaking perfect English is probably way overblown compared to, um, you know, the lack of confidence, for example. And so what we end up thinking, we actually talk ourselves into a corner by saying, well, I could never be a counselor because my English wasn't good enough. Um, no, that's, that, that first of all, is the wrong reason. <laughs> Um, yeah. to not, 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 not to, to not do that, but, um, but it's really important to understand that, um, you know, it's more important to, to focus on getting, getting your confidence built up and also more important to focus on the mission. So, um, yeah, very, very good point there. Um, so Will's got a good question around local government. <laughs> hey, Jay Um, I was wondering what, what made you want to be a counselor in local government? Was there an event or a frustration that made you put your hat in the ring? And I suppose as a follow-up to that, what led you or pushed you into the deputy mayoral position? How was that received amongst your community and friends? Oh, great question, Will. And I think, you know, any, anyone at the age of 23 wouldn't think about local government as a career path. But, um, I was, um, simply, it was an issue that really drove me. Um, I had an experience where I visited some student accommodation in, within the city of Monash, uh, vicinity, and I saw the, the decrepit, the um, standards that they were living in. Um, we, we tried to, you know, we started a petition, we got some cam local campaigning going to get the local councillors at the time, the local government at the time to have better planning laws to ensure that student accommodation built, um, in the area, you know, met the standards of, of, um, of, you know, basic human decency around spacing and around air quality, et cetera. We lobbied the local university, Monash University, because they had a, a, a big role to play in student accommodation because a lot of the accommodation was actually theirs. So it really was an issue that drove me, Will, because, um, when I wrote to the councillors, they ignored me, did not want to talk, did not want to take action. So I'm like. Stuff it. I'm going to put my hand in the ring and run myself. Um, and I remember running and, um, and the, the political party I was a part of the time said to me, mate, I've got some advice for you. You need to take this and said, your name, you need to change the name because when people look at that name, they're not going to vote for you because they, they just assume you can't speak English. When they look at your name on the ballot, they just assume that you are a hack. You are a, a running mate there to funnel votes to the actual candidate. And uh, so please go and change your name. And I said. Not with a million dollars made in doctoring women, because I always believe that, um, certainly it's a very sort of cultural belief that, uh, besides the gift of life, um, your name is the most important thing that your parents give you because they, they want you to sort of adhere to certain values and expectations and they, that's the, that's the aspiration for you. Um, in terms of like that Chinese cultural realm, you know, most Chinese names have, or most Asian names have a lot of meaning behind it. So I wasn't willing to give that up. So I said, stuck you to the people who gave me that pathetic advice, um, worked hard and paid, knocked on every door, letterboxed every house, talked to every person who would talk to me. I had so many like evening teas with like elderly residents. I've lost count. They would just invite me to the house and we'll just have tea and talk about the issues of the world. Um, and I was very fortunate to be elected by like I mean, 400, 500 votes. So I got in. Um, and the first thing I did was actually implement a student accommodation policy where we, um, you know, where the city of Monash actually had guidelines around what to expect from developers and from investing in building student accommodation. So I took action to my own hands, um, and, and sort of that gave me a lifelong passion about affordable housing. Like that became a real policy FP for me for many years. And then, uh, from then on, um, had the opportunity to take on the deputy mayoral role. And I think, um, what was exciting about that was, believe it or not, the city of Monash, for those who know Melbourne, it's pretty much a mini China field. Uh, you know, Glen Waverley was like the heartland of Asian Australian communities, but they've never had a Chinese Australian or an Asian Australian representative on that council. Um, and I was a since one, very honored to, to be able to hold that mantle. Um, and I remember when I became deputy mayor, um, there was a lot of, um, appreciation and a lot of, um, uh, you know, admiration for that because people just didn't expect someone like me to take on that role. Uh, people didn't expect a skinny Asian kid, you know, uh, to, to sort of be deputy mayor of the council. They didn't expect someone like me to stand on the podium to welcome new citizens when they, when they do their citizenship pledge. That was one of the best joys of being a councillor actually was officiating citizenship ceremony. Um, I had a chance to be mayor. I had two chances to be mayor, but I didn't take it. Um, because, uh, the, the exchange was if 
my colleagues made me mayor, then there was, there was a laundry list of things that they wanted me to do. Um, and I didn't agree with like 60% of them. So I said to myself, you know what? I'm not going to betray my principles. I'm not going to betray what I stand for. Um, and that means losing the mayoral team. So be it. Um, you know, you know, the mayoral team had a significant pay raise, had a, you get a car, you get special number plates, you know, you get, you get to wear the robe, which I was never going to wear the robe anyway, but I, I decided, you know what, I'm not going to sell my principles. I'm not going to allow these people to politically blackmail me for the whole year. Um, if that means becoming the mayor. So I turned that down twice, um, and decided to focus myself on policy, on change, on getting things done. GSD. That's my principle. GSD, getting shit done. Sorry if I can't say the S word on PDF, Jeff, and you might have to edit that out. <laughs> Certainly the, 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 um, the, the, the principle that I took. So hopefully that answers your question, Will. Yeah, it does. Thanks. That, uh, yep. Yeah, um, at 23, that's a, a, a big thing to throw you out in the ring and decide to do, but well done. Thanks. Yeah. Awesome. And Tal is a great question around, uh, what the, what if? Well, uh, uh Hi, Tao. <laughs> um, you're very a big country um, and you know, kill lots of people achieving what you have so far. So my question goes back to when your deputy principles said that you didn't have the leadership skills. Do you think you had a different career path if it wasn't for the drive to prove them wrong? Um, I don't think so. I think, you know, at the time, um, it was, it was, it was hurtful. It didn't, it didn't help. Um, but it did sort of light a fire in me back then, you know, to, to, uh, to try and be the best that I could be and, and actually stop kidding myself. Like I was not good at math. I was not good at science. So stop taking on that. I actually be authentic and be real. I, I love history. I love politics. I love the humanities. So I decided, you know what, I'm just going to take that path in year 12 and, and do that. Um, so I think that was more the game changer for me was deciding to pivot from maths and, and science to, to humanities. Uh, but, but I guess, you know, sometimes you look back and you're like, you know what, things happen for a reason. And when I returned to the school as deputy mayor and the principal was still there, um, you know, there was a bit of a vindication for me that, you know what, I'm hoping that by me being here today, that you would have learned an incredible life lesson. And it was even more humorous when he was lobbying me for, when he was lobbying me for money to invest in his $2 million swimming pool. Um, and then he tried to, he tried to appeal to my, uh, to my good nature by saying, you're a, an alumni, you want to help your own school. I'm like, you know what, this is public money. We don't fund private schools. I'm really sorry. Like, you know, I'd rather give dollars to the public school down the road. I can't give it to you guys. No, thanks. Um, so that was, that was particularly nice to be able to reject him on that. Um, but I, I think, you know, for, for me to, uh, I think it, it's, it's, it's mainly that, that sort of experience move, that insight moving from the maths and the sciences to the, to, to the humanities was a real game changer for me. Awesome. Now, just being aware of the time, um, I will, uh, conclude the formal session of, uh, for part of this, uh, this evening, but, uh, certainly we're all going to invite everyone to stay behind for an informal chat after this, after the, uh, record button goes off. Um, but, uh, there will be a link that's been provided or we've, well, thanks for attending this event tonight. There'll be a link that, um, will be provided in the chat box so that you can tell us what you thought about this event to give us a bit of feedback so we can improve. Um, I would also like to give you a, um, uh, well, actually I would like to mention the upcoming event on the 18th of November, 7 PM, uh, Ronnie Eltit, the CEO of, of Incentra founded an IT company with an incredible culture will be speaking on. Uh, from vision to vocal leadership. Um, and also Tu Li will be coming up, uh, which will be the last event of the year. So Tu Li will be, uh, speaking to us later on the, please follow us for the, uh, for the details. So, uh, in, you know, consistent to our beliefs at PDF, we share what we learned on our social media. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel, like our page on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. You can find our website on www.professionaldevelopmentforum.org. So thank you all for attending and good evening. Uh, and please feel free to stay behind uh, and uh, have have an informal chat with uh, Ji Yong. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Hmm. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Wang, the founder of the Professional Development Forum. PDF was established to help young diverse professionals find fulfillment in the modern Australian workplace. By asking questions to the most successful, influential and inspirational people we knew. We were inspired by their stories of tenacity and passion. 
we learn about the creative approaches to overcome challenges. We believe that everyone, not just the elite few, should have access to the knowledge, mindset and network to develop themselves. By becoming the best version of ourselves, we lead a happier, more fulfilling life and inspire those around us to do the same. Moving our events online has made us more accessible than ever. We share what we learned on our website, YouTube channel and podcast. So please share this video, subscribe to our channel and turn on the notification bell. We look forward to seeing you at an upcoming event.